Today we're looking at river regimes and I'm definitely going to struggle to pronounce that term, river regimes. We're going to be looking at the definition, we're going to be looking at the factors which affect it as well as some storm hydrographs. So I'm hoping you'll find this video super useful. First of all, let's start with the definition of a river regime. And this is the way in which the river's discharge changes over time. Remember that the river's discharge is the volume of water carried by a river at any one place. So we need to consider why would that volume increase or decrease at any particular point in time. We do also like to look at it over the course of a year so we can make predictions and understand more about the behaviour of a river at any particular season or point in time. So if we consider the sort of things which will increase the river's discharge, well, first of all, heavy precipitation, so heavy rainfall, what that means is that the ground gets saturated very quickly, which increases surface runoff, meaning that there's a shorter lag time so that water that falls from the sky will flow directly into the river. So that will influence the river regime in that way, increasing the river's discharge. If we increase the temperature, so hotter days, there'll be more evapotranspiration, so that will remove water from the river. What about vegetation now, some more biotic factors? Well, vegetation such as trees will intercept that rainfall, meaning that there's a bit of a delay in that rain reaching the ground. So you'll get slower infiltration of the ground and that will increase the lag time. So that means there'll be a delay in that water reaching the river. In terms of land use and humans activity, this can actually alter the river regime in opposing ways. So for example, because humans might put in drainage channels, more canals. So obviously that will take water away from the river. However, urbanization generally, and by that I mean building settlements, what that means is there's less ground for that water to soak into, to infiltrate. So in this situation, you'll end up with more surface runoff and that water will wash into the rivers, meaning that there's a decreased lag time. So look at it from two points of view, either human behaviours which will divert that water away into canals, into drainage channels, or the fact that we're building more, concreting our surfaces, meaning that you get more surface runoff and therefore greater river discharge. And in that latter situation, you will find that that creates more of a flashy river regime. Other things humans do could include water abstraction, and that's where humans remove water from the river for particular uses. That could be an industry, that could be to water crops, so irrigation, or that could even be for consumption purposes, washing, cleaning, etc. And then lastly, dams. Again, this is something that is human built. Dams are often built in order to trap water within a reservoir and then through the process of HEP, so that's hydroelectric power, these dams are used to generate power for our homes. Again, that will affect the river's regime. So broadly speaking, if you're asked to describe the factors which affect river regime, let's talk about precipitation, let's talk about temperature, let's talk about vegetation, land use, water abstraction and dams and break your answer up into those various categories and provide the extra details that I've already given you previously in this video. Now we'll look at storm hydrographs. Just to remind you, a storm hydrograph, those are seagulls if you can hear it, graph which shows how a river's discharge changes over time and that's typically before, during or after a storm event. Why are storm hydrographs so useful? Because they provide valuable insights into the relationship between rainfall and river flow and that's important because lots of people build their homes within drainage basins and a huge amount of time and money is spent building these homes so storm hydrographs provide valuable insights that enable you to predict floods and understand how bad those floods will be so that people can make informed decisions about what to do, whether they can stay in their homes and put out sandbags or whether they need to leave. But now we're going to go onto my iPad and actually have a look more closely at a storm hydrograph. So let's have a look at a typical storm hydrograph. And I found this diagram on geographyaslevelaqa.wordpress.com. So typically you'll find three things on these graphs. To the right hand side we can see precipitation, so that tends to be rainfall and that's given in millimetres. On the left hand side we're looking at river discharge, so that's the volume of water flowing through the river at any one particular place. And then at the bottom we have a time scale. Now there are two types of flow which affect the discharge of a river in a storm hydrograph. First of all we have the base flow, which is the normal discharge of the river, which we can see bottom right in the baby blue spotty section, that is the river's usual discharge. With the storm flow, which we can see on the key on the left hand side, 
this is when you're going to see a huge increase in the river's discharge that tends to be in line with a huge amount of precipitation. And so we call the storm flow the extra discharge of a river which results from a storm. Now, a couple of extra things. We've already mentioned lag time, but we can see it really clearly here. It's the difference between the time it takes to go from that peak rainfall to the peak discharge, which we can see is the peak on that graph. So that is your lag time. So I'll write a couple of notes for you now. So as I've already said, storm hydrographs show river discharge precipitation and time. They have a base flow, which is the normal discharge of a river, as well as a storm flow, which is the extra discharge of a river, which results from a storm. Sometimes they could ask you for the reasons for different shapes of storm hydrographs. And really what we're talking about here is why the lag time would change for different areas because a change in lag time will change the shape of that graph. So you might see shorter lag times in urban areas due to concrete paths. You might see shorter lag times in urban areas due to steeper slopes. I will agree that one is a little bit random, but I have seen it on a MART scheme. Conversely, you'd have longer lag times in rural areas. So places where lots of farming takes place. Why? Because there'll be lots of vegetation to intercept that rainfall and delay that water reaching the river. as well as water taking a long time to infiltrate through rocks. Right guys, I hope you found that video super helpful. I'll be back soon with another geography video.